Welcome to the Empowering Agriculture Through Tribal Sovereignty Academy. This resource will cover food safety traceability, um, including a discussion on the US Food and Drug Administration's proposed rule on traceability requirements across the food supply chain. And this resource will largely be targeted to um, beginning farmers and ranchers and other agricultural enterprises that are working to support um, food access in their markets and in their communities. So as we move forward throughout this module, um, we'll be providing a brief outline on the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, helping to contextualize what traceability means under the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, looking at some considerations for managing supply chain relationships, including a discussion on the proposed rule for traceability um, that was released by the food US Food and Drug Administration, and help to build on the baseline of some um, standard practices for consideration as to what these things actually look like um, in your own activities. So as we look at the history of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, when we were founded in the University of Arkansas School of Law in 2013 by Dean Emeritus Stacy Leeds, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And at that time, Dean Leeds was the only Native American female dean of a law school anywhere across the country. And it's co-founded by, um, by Janie Sims Hip, um, who is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Now, our mission today is to enhance health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural food traditions in Indian country. And we engage these activities through a number of um, ways, including um, working with tribal governments directly and the, through the establishment of a model tribal food and agriculture code, which sets a comprehensive standard um, of food and agriculture laws that can be reviewed, adopted, and implemented by tribes. And this is available at no cost to them. Um, we also work with agricultural enterprises and food systems across Indian country to help scale up through production tools and economic forecast models, um, supporting strong tribal food businesses and food systems. And, um, we, under a cooperative agreement, um, kind of more broadly serve um, alongside our key partners at the Intertribal Agriculture Council and the University of Arizona um, to build out a tribal food safety alliance, providing education, training, and outreach to tribal nations and communities, food growers and processors and manufacturers on the Food Safety Modernization Act. And while we engage and work with Indian country in a number of other areas, um, we are available as a resource, um, both through the EATS Academy and kind of in these spaces more directly. So as we look at the Food Safety Modernization Act, it was enacted by Congress in 2011 as a law of general applicability. And what this means, kind of broadly speaking, is that no matter if you are operating on tribal lands or off tribal lands, if you meet the um, income or other threshold requirements that are posed under the rule, um, you, as part of this law of general applicability, must comply with the food safety modern those food safety modernization act provisions. So kind of across the board, FISMA established a national standard for what food safety risk mitigation and response meant across the US food supply chain. And Congress in establishing or enacting this law designated the US Food and Drug Administration or FDA with regulatory authority because this was the largest and the most sweeping piece of um, kind of standardization of practice um, across um, agricultural activities kind of writ large in the US, um, FDA broke up um, FISMA compliance into seven different rules, including produce safety and kind of looking at the production of fresh fruits and vegetables on farm, um, the prevention of intentional contamination or adulteration, which includes kind of making sure that you are not intentionally um, creating or are growing a product that is, as I mentioned, intentionally designed to make someone sick. Preventive controls for human foods and for animal foods, 
um, setting of standards or practice for processors and manufacturers of foods um, does designated or designed for either human or animal consumption and uh, many others, including the sanitary transportation of human and animal food, um, foreign supplier verification programs, and the accreditation of third-party auditors and certification bodies. So as we look at um, what this actually means for your operation, um, as you are either staging your operation um, and just getting started, or as you are you know, working to build out what your enterprise is doing, um, understanding where you are in the supply chain can really be helpful in promoting um, resilience in your distribution channels, how goods flow from kind of your suppliers um, to you as the either producer or processor, and then from you to whomever you um, are working with um, as your um, consumer or the purchaser of those products or services. And so the Food Safety Modernization Act generally only requires you to assess um, for your operation specifically, all nodes one link up and all nodes one link down from your operation. Um, that can also be a matter of best practice um, when you're looking at kind of managing your supply chain relationships. And then, so as you map out who those first tier vendors are um, for your production or processing activity, and that might include um, suppliers or even for um, farmers or ranchers, um, kind of where your, um, where your animals or where your product is being grown um, on your operation. And then one node down, or one, all nodes, excuse me, one link down, including those first tier customers. So they may be um, distributors or aggregators, or they may even be your consumer directly. Um, kind of understanding how all of these different pieces together um, is a first step at acknowledging the traceability and how you contribute to the traceability of an agricultural product. So we can think about traceability as the ability to track how a food product is produced, moves, is sold or otherwise distributed and is altered. And that can be like processed or manufactured if that's applicable along the food supply chain. And so depending on what your um, enterprise is, is doing um, for your operation, um, different traceability requirements or considerations may apply. But as you're looking at kind of supporting um, good practice, a standard of good practice for um, traceability. Um, it's so hard to be able to attest how food moves through from one end of your operation to another to be sold or, or distributed, um, depending on kind of what your enterprise is looking at doing um, without having solid record keeping. Um, now good records help to tell this your story um, and affirm proactive food safety activities um, that your operation is engaging in to support the health and well-being and the viability of the communities and the markets that you're working with. And inversely, this is not something that anyone necessarily hopes for, but if there is an incident where there is a foodborne illness that results from the consumption of a product that was grown or produced or processed um, on your operation, um, good records may also help to reduce some of the economic windfall associated with a recall. So on September 23rd, 2020, um, FDA published a proposed rule listing key data, excuse me, key data elements across critical tracking events for foods identified on a food traceability list. And it sounds like a bunch of jargon, but I'll be walking through what each of these different pieces mean over the next few slides. So why did FDA do this? So we know that um, no matter kind of what food has been produced, um, food carries the potential um, for spreading a foodborne illness outbreak. Those who produce and process and manufacture foods can also be proactive in addressing those risks and identifying and promoting activities to support good food safety behavior that um, allows for foods uh, consumers to readily eat those foods and not um, 
and of incurring um, a foodborne illness. And so as we look across these different time spans um, from 1996 to 2014, and then from 2015 to 2019, um, there are types of foods that have been more readily identified um, as being the quote unquote cause um, of the foodborne illness outbreak. And um, as, as pathogen, um, whether they be bacteria or parasites or viruses that take root um, in that product, and then um, they move from the um, entry point into the food supply chain to the market where they are purchased by communities of people, by families and households. And so FDA outbreaks linked to um, contaminated produce um, likely prior to retail. Um, so FDA in kind of looking at the standards of traceability that were previously in place was able to identify these commodities um, as the cause. Um, but we know in looking at this as well, that it can be very difficult and without taking some proactive steps to really identify where a foodborne illness is coming from. And so FDA released a proposed rule on food traceability um, to break down each of these different steps, looking at the development of a food, the food traceability list um, where FDA ranked or used a risk ranking model um, for foods requiring additional tracing based on uh, microbiological foodborne illnesses and the rate of those illnesses. Um, now this list refers to single ingredient foods and any recipe containing these foods as an ingredient. So as we look at um, the production of these foods or anyone that would then the process or manufacture foods that are on this list, um, there are critical tracking events that are referenced here that can be uh, largely thought of as either nodes or areas of activity that trigger traceability records. And what is listed in those traceability records is highlighted under key data elements for information that's necessary in record keeping across critical tracking events. So these all feed into each other. As you think about um, the types of foods that are listed under this proposed rule, um, we largely see kind of a breakdown of different foods that um, are brought into the system through a variety of channels, including um, farming, including um, you know, fishing, and um, kind of the harvesting of of marine life, including mollusks and crustaceans, as well as um, processors and manufacturers of goods such as soft cheeses. So as we think about um, critical tracking events, um, as we look at these different lists, um, we see a breakdown of critical tracking events as growing, creating, transforming, shipping, and receiving um, foods that are on the traceability list. Growing as the name suggests, is on-farm production of these foods. Um, creating is making or producing of a food on the food traceability list through the manufacturing or processing of an ingredient that is not on the food traceability list, like soft cheese. Um, transforming is an event where you are changing a food that is on the food traceability list, um, changing its packaging and or its label, um, such as by combining the ingredients or processing the food. Now, shipping is not the actual shipment of the food, but it is the arranging of transport. And so it's everything that leads up to shipping that food item. And then receiving is anything that kind of leads up or responds to the receipt of the food item um, by a customer other than the consumer. So as we look at um, the growing key data element, um, the link so it requires you to link traceability lot codes to the growing area coordinates. And so as we think about um, all inputs where all um, suppliers kind of one link up in your food supply chain, again, if you are growing food that is on the food traceability list, um, the, how, that, how you are receiving that food is actually in working with the land. And so the, um, proposed rule that is referenced under FDA um, requires you to kind of keep track of 
where those specific food items are grown on your operation. And again, we've broken down some of the foods that are on the food traceability list here um, for consideration and ease of reference, including um, shell eggs, if you are working to, um, if you have um, a chicken operation on your um, farm, um, might include cucumbers, herbs, melons, leafy greens, peppers, sprouts, tomatoes, and tropical tree fruits. So if you are um, growing sprouts, because um, sprouts um, are so nuanced in their production mechanism or, or the, the production cycle, there are some additional um, key data elements to consider across each of these activities as they relate to um, sprout production or moving sprouts um, up until the point where they are actually farmed. So for those who are specifically growing um, seeds for sprouting, the key data elements to reference here as part of your traceability records include um, where those sprouts are grown in the operation, um, any lot code that you've developed to keep track of you know, moving these foods across your production, and then the day of harvest, uh, when you're actually harvesting these foods to move them into the next uh, part for the process, which might include um, seed processors and conditioners. And so for seed processors and conditioners, You've got to carry forward any location identifiers and descriptions that are associated with that lot, um, the associated seed lot code um, from the grower, and then the date of conditioning or processing. As they move forward through the system into the packing houses after they've been processed and conditioned, you've got to continue to carry that information forward, um, looking at the location of when these activities, of where these activities happen, um, the associated seed lot codes and then dates of conditioning and processing. Um, once they've moved from kind of packing to being the, a seed supplier um, of the um, enterprise that would actually be growing that sprout as a sprouter, um, you've got to keep track of any of those location identifiers and descriptions, um, the taxonomic name of the seeds that have been grown, um, growing specifications, um, that have um, been used to support um, that sprout moving through the system, the volume of production, how much seed has actually moved through um, your operation in relation to these different packing houses, um, seed processors and conditioners and growers, what types of packaging you're using, um, any antimicrobial treatment that you are using associated with those um, seeds, and any associated seed lot codes that you have actually added into um, kind of the, the consolidation of these seeds and that have been carried forward um, from these seed packing houses. And then the sprouters directly um, need to account for any new lot code um, that has been used as part of their production operation, the date of the receipt by the sprouter from the seed supplier, any of those uh, sprout traceability lot codes, and then the associated dates of production. The key data elements for shipping, and again, um, shipping relates to um, the arrangement of shipping um, for any of the foods that are on the food traceability list. Um, so those uh, key data elements require you to link the traceability of the lot code to the um, Entry numbers that are assigned to the food, if this a food's been imported inter, from an international supplier, um, the quantity and unit of measure of the food, um, traceability product identifiers, and the description of the food that is intended to be shipped, um, the lot code for the location, description of that location, and the point of contact for who is doing the shipping the shipment location, where the food's actually intended to be shipped from, uh, the date and time of the shipment, uh, the reference record indicators and numbers for any shipment documents that are associated with kind of the bill of sale for moving these foods off of your enterprise. And then who is actually, where, which, um, what organization or business is kind of being designated as the shipping 
agent. So shippers must keep the above records, but really these key data elements are being consolidated um, by the individual doing the shipping. The shipper must also transmit this above information, except any um, reference record type indicators. Uh, those are documents that are arrangements between the shipper and the shipping company or, or business or individual. The, any numbers that are associated with that and the transporter's name. So if the shipper is a farm, um, if the enterprise that is arranging for the shipping is a production or on-farm entity, um, some additional key data elements that come into the, um, the traceability lot code or that would feed into the traceability lot code include a statement that the shipper is a farm, the originator of the food, if it's not the farm as the shipper, so the, where that food is otherwise coming from, the harvester of the food, if it's not the shipper. So that would include like who actually engaged in the harvesting activity, a point of contact on that operation, a way of getting a hold of them and the date and time of the harvesting, um, cold storage activities. If this has not been done by the farm that is conducting the shipping specifically, including where those um, the, the food was kept under cold storage and a description of, and of those um, practices that were used, and then the date and time of the cooling. And then also the packer, um, if that was not the farm as the shipper. So who packed the food, um, kind of a description of what packing activities look like, and then the date and time of the packing. So key data elements associated with um, creating a food as a um, key tracking of a critical tracking event um, require um, enterprises that are quote unquote creating a food to link traceability lot codes associated with the foods that are on the food traceability list um, to and if the location and description for where that food is being created, um, the date where the creation was completed, the traceability of identifier for the product, including a description of what foods were created, um, how much of the food was created, including like a unit of measure, any reference record types and numbers relating to that um, creating activity. And so some foods that you might consider as being, um, might qualify um, for this creating critical tracking um, step include like soft cheeses, um, nut butters, because nuts aren't generally otherwise listed on the food traceability list, um, fresh cut fruits and vegetables, depending on kind of what those inputs are. And the similar consideration would be anything from like a ready to eat deli salad. And so meats um, aren't otherwise listed as a, some meats aren't otherwise listed and the food traceability list. And so depending on you know, what those inputs are here, uh, it might also qualify as a creating activity. For transforming activities, um, the proposed rule requires uh, those enterprises to link traceability lot codes to um, the uh, product identifier and description, um, how much food um, of each traceability lot was used in the transformation, the new traceability product identifier associated with um, the food after it's been um, transformed, and a description for what food was produced in transformation, um, the quantity and the unit of measure of food that is produced through transformation, and any reference record indicators or numbers um, related to that transformation activity. And so again, as we think about transforming events, um, we can think about those situations where a manufacturer or a processor is using a food that is on the food traceability list to make another food product, including changing the packaging. As we look at key data elements that are associated with receivers, and receivers are, again, um, anyone 
where or the stage in which a um, the a, an individual or organization is receiving a shipment at a designated location, and so the proposed rule requires receivers to link their traceability lock codes of the product to the location identifier and description of the immediate previous source of where that product was shipped from. The entry numbers that's assigned to the food, again, if that food was imported from an international supplier. The location identifier and description of where the food was received. The date and time that the food was received. The quantity and unit of measurement of the food and that was received, including like if the food was received through six cases of 25 returnable plastic with 25 returnable plastic containers. Traceability product identifiers and product descriptions of the food or food items that were received. Um, the location identifier, description, and um, point of contact for the traceability lock code that was generated as part of these food items. Um, and any reference record types and record numbers, such as like the invoice number or bill of lading uh, related for the receipt of the food. And then the name of the transporter who you actually received the food from um, as the intermediary distributor. So in addition to some key data elements for receivers, um, there are um, key data elements that FDA is requiring um, or intended to require, intending to require, excuse me, um, enterprises to adopt if they are the first receiver of a product that is on the food traceability list. And that would be the first person or individual organization, enterprise, et cetera, other than a farm uh, who purchases and takes physical possession of a food on the, F, the food traceability list. And so um, if you are the um, first receiver um, of like, fish product um, that is related to the food traceability list, the key data elements that are required here include the traceability lot code that's associated with the food being received, um, the location identifier and description of the food originator. Now from the food harvester, um, from the fish harvester um, would be um, the business name, um, the point of contact, including the phone number and the date and time of harvest from the food cooler, if that's applicable, if that those fish products um, went through cold storage or any similar activity, be the location identifier and description of the cold storage activity that was conducted for the food and the date and time of cooling. And then from the food packer, it'd be the location identifier and description of that food packer, where that food packer is located and the date and time of packing. So as we look at the um, kind of location of the harvester um, that can relate to um, kind of different, um, different requirements or considerations. So looking at um, first receivers um, from fishing vessels or after fishing vessels, um, that would include um, the traceability lot code um, the harvest date range. So when those um, vessels were actually out at sea or their general location of where that harvesting activity was conducted and the location for that trip um, as it relates to either the National Marine Fisheries Services Ocean Geographic Code or more specific geographical coordinates. So as we look at um, which enterprises or, or which food items kind of qualify um, in enterprise to be considered a first receiver, only foods that are originated um, as it's assigned under the rule um, can have a first receiver. And that includes um, foods that are grown, raised, caught, or harvested, such as um, shell eggs. Uh, there are some exemptions that come into play under this proposed rule. 
Now for growers, um, those exemptions currently include um, enterprises that earn less than $25,000 average annual sales during the past three years. Um, those enterprises that operate with less than um, 3,000 laying hens with respect to shell eggs that are produced. Food that um, on the food um, traceability list that is sold um, direct to consumer um, from that farmer or from that grower. Um, food produced and packaged on farm um, with some stipulation here that the food that is produced and packaged on the operation must have a consistent package um, across the food supply chain that does not allow it to otherwise be adulterated um, where it would be considered a potential at potential risk of contaminating someone from with a foodborne illness. Um, additional um, exemptions that may apply um, under that excuse me, that apply under FDA's proposed rule for traceability include um, food identified as rarely consumed raw by the Food and Drug Administration. We'll get into why in just a second. And then food produced for personal like on-farm consumption or personal consumption by that grower. For um, any growers that may qualify for these exemptions, um, it's important to reflect here that as we've seen with other elements of the Food Safety Modernization Act, that commercial markets are still requiring compliance. And so depending on who you're selling to as a um, first tier vendor, or excuse me, a first tier customer, um, there may be some additional economic incentive that makes sure that you are keeping records associated with these activities. For um, those that are creating or transforming foods, um, there are some important considerations to reflect here. So if a food has been identified by the Food and Drug Administration as rarely consumed raw, um, it is likely to go through a processing or kill step. And so the proposed rule indicates that any food that's on the food traceability list that receives commercial processing that is sufficient enough to reduce the presence of microorganisms of public health significance um, is eligible for um, exemption under um, the traceability, the proposed traceability rule. Um, some additional um, potential eligibility for an exemption under the proposed rule include, includes um, creators or transformers of um, food where all eggs on the farm that have been received um, receive treatment as outlined in the egg safety rule. And so if um, either of these two conditions are met, then no matter where you are operating um, across the um, critical um, tracking list, um, the growers, creators, transformers, et cetera, um, those food items specifically are exempt from having to um, like maintain records um, as indicated under um, FDA's proposed rule. Um, that may change under FDA's final rule. So that is certainly worth keeping an eye out for. For shipping entities, um, the transporters of food that are on the food traceability list are exempt from shipping record requirements other than to pass um, the require, those required um, key data elements from the shipper to the enterprise or individual that is receiving those foods. And then for food access points, if those food access points are 501c3 nonprofit food establishments, or if they are establishments that do not otherwise typically operate um, as a food retail entity, such as like apartments that are holding food for um, one of their residents or offices that are holding food for um, a, a party or event or for like someone's lunch, um, those um, food access points are not required to keep um, receiver key data elements. Um, entities or activities that qualify for partial exemption as indicated under FDA's proposed rule um, include um, commingling those entities, excuse me, that commingle raw agricultural products um, post-harvest, but pre-processing 
that are not subject to the produce safety rule. And so what that generally means is, um, and if, if you are kind of bringing together shell eggs from a number of different um, uh, sources, a number of different farms and kind of commingling them together, and if you are um, an entity that must register through FDA's uh, food uh, facility registration system, um, the main records that that enterprise would need to keep um, include the immediate previous source of all of those foods that were commingled together, and then the immediate subsequent recipient of those food items um, that kind of uh, pull together as like the, the lot that was sold um, to that recipient. For um, retail food establishments, um, per saying, purchasing um, food that is on the food traceability list directly from the farm, and those retail food establishments would only need to, under the proposed rule, establish and maintain record for 180 days, including information on the name and address of the farm sourcing the food. If you are a far, um, farm that is purchasing from, excuse me, a school that is purchasing from a farm, or a public institution that is purchasing from a farm, um, those partial exemption requirements are similar to retail food establishments, um, where those entities would also only need to establish and maintain records for 180 days, including information on the name and address of where that food was sourced from, or which farm that food was sourced from. For fishing vessels, um, entities, and, and this specifically applies to entities that must register through FDA's food facility registration system, those fishing vessels must maintain or qualify for a partial exemption, only maintain records identifying um, kind of the previous source of the food, so where that food came from, and then the immediate subsequent recipient of the food. So under the proposed rule, um, FDA has solicited comments for whether small retail food establishments with less than 10 full-time employees would be exempt or partially exempt from this rule. And so that is something that we will keep an eye out for once FDA publishes their final rule. And um, we will be releasing updated guidance um, uh, once that um, final rule is made available for the public. It is important here to note that once FDA does publish its final rule, may anticipate that um, any entity that would otherwise be required to comply or follow suit with that final rule, including um, those entities that don't qualify, or such as like exempting those entities that qualify for a full exemption. Um, though people would generally have 60 days um, after the publishing of that final rule to um, consolidate and keep record of those key data elements associated with those traceability lot codes. So as we look at how all of these different actors kind of play out across critical tracking events, we wanted to provide some examples kind of break these things down into practice. And so if you are looking at seafood, for example, Again, fishing boats qualify for a partial exemption where they really generally have to identify where the food is coming from and where the food is being um, sold or distributed to. But once it leaves the fishing boat, um, then it might move to like a seafood processor, um, someone that's actually going to be um, cutting up these fish into fillets, just as an example. And so that seafood processor would be the first receiver as well as a regular receiver. And so that seafood processor would have to follow and keep track of the key data elements that are associated with both of those conditions, as well as um, any of um, the key data elements that are associated with shipping. Once the food's been processed accordingly, it might move to a distributor where those foods are consolidated for movement out to retail or commercial markets or other institutions. And so the distributor or the aggregator would be a receiver of those foods. Um, they might be a 
um, transformer of the foods as they move those food items from one package to another, but they would also be a shipper of those foods. And then a restaurant as a food establishment or food retail establishment um, would be a receiver of those foods. Sprouts, again, because sprouts have a little bit more nuance um, for seed growers and harvesters, um, you would be a grower of those foods as well as a shipper for the sprouts or a, because you would be arranging them for shipment. Um, for seed processors, uh, you would also be have to keep track of kind of growing key data elements, um, receiving key data elements because you have received those foods or, or those seeds um, from the grower or harvester. And then you would also have to keep track of um, shipping KDEs um, because you would be moving them through that next step in the food supply chain um, into seed packing houses, um, which might include um, growing activities, um, shipping activities, and receiving activities. Um, for seed suppliers, um, you may also qualify under um, where you might be engaging in activities that have growing considerations. But because you are a receiver um, of those foods from the packing houses, you would have to keep track of receiving KDEs as well as um, shipping key data elements since you were you would be intending to move them to that final um, production of the sprout at the sprouter. And so the sprouter would be keeping track of those key data elements um, associated with those growing activities. Um, they would keep track of receiving key data elements because they've received um, those sprouts from the supplier. And then they would keep track of shipping key data elements because they are intending to move those to a distributor or an aggregator. The distributor here, because that is the first um, enterprise after the farm, um, would qualify as the first receiver. Um, they would also qualify as a general receiver and they would need to keep track of a shipping key data elements associated with the traceability lot codes for all of those foods. And then um, finally, as they kind of move through into like a grocery or C store, the um, C store or grocery store would need to keep track of those receiving key data elements. If you have um, a, in a situation kind of moving through the food supply chain where you are working with um, pepper poppers, um, as an example. So the peppers themselves, because they are on the food traceability list, um, the grower and harvester would have key data elements to keep track of as well as shipping key data elements as they move to on-farm cooling. And so any even the movement on-farm um, requires the maintenance of key data elements as all of these activities um, correspond across the food supply chain. Um, you'd have a um, receiving key data element as well as shipping key data elements um, as they move to on-farm packing houses those also have receiving and shipping key data elements that are associated. So we, as we think about what the ingredients are for like pepper poppers, um, you have the pepper component, but you also have um, a kind of cheese component as well, typically. And so you've got the dairy farm, which is producing milk that is not on the food traceability list. So there aren't requirements that are specific here. You've got the um, soft cheese manufacturer, which has um, creating key data elements because they are creating a food that is on the food traceability list, as well as um, shipping um, requirements or key data elements. Um, that soft cheese might be moved to a distributor. Um, and because that food hasn't been originated, um, that doesn't have the, um, it's, it, that doesn't qualify as a first receiver. But the distributor of that cheese would still have to keep track of general receiver key data elements as well as shipping key data elements as they arrange that food to be kind of moved into a processor. And so the processor would actually be taking the peppers that have been grown as well as the cheese and transforming these um, two food items into a singular product. 
And so the processor would have transforming key data elements because they are modifying peppers. Um, they would have um, first receiver key data elements because they would be the first entity after the pepper farm to receive those food items. Specifically talking about the key data elements that are associated with those peppers. And they would have receiver key data elements that are associated with the peppers as well as the cheese and then shipping key data elements as they move to um, kind of moving those pepper poppers that have been produced over to an aggregator or a distributor. And the distributor would have key data elements here that are associated with receiving and shipping the product. And then the C store, um, if your C store was to sell um, something like a pepper popper, um, would have or a commercially produced um, pepper popper um, through a, that was produced by, at a processor. Um, they would have the receiving um, key data element that's associated with those traceability lock codes. So, so we look at um, those kind of speak to kind of more broadly the key data elements that are associated with the um, activities across the critical tracking list. But that's not the only a set of affirmations that farms specifically might need to navigate. And so if you're looking at um, on-farm production and you're growing tomatoes just as, as part of this example that are intended to be processed or like a pasta sauce, you've got the different commercial or different inputs that correspond with the production of those tomatoes. You might have, um, you might purchase compost um, commercially, um, as well as use public water for irrigation. And those are the different inputs that would feed into um, your tomato production on that farm. And so under the produce safety rule, and this is not corresponding with the traceability rule, but another rule um, as I mentioned, that is under FISMA. Um, those farms uh, would need to keep affirmations of um, from the commercial composters, including the um, and the intermediary supplier, um, if they're not purchasing that compost from the composter directly. So the farm would need to uh, keep affirmations of that the supplier the, the composter complied with the scientifically valid process for treating that soil amendment and that that soil amendment was stored in a way that minimizes the risk of cross-contamination. And to learn more about those different factors or considerations, I'd encourage you to look at um, or a review our webinars that we host on the produce safety rule at nativefoodsafety.org um, corresponding with module three on soil amendments. For the public water inputs, um, tomato farms in this hypothetical example um, would be required to keep an affirmation from the municipal water supply that, affirm, that speak to the test results or the current certificate of compliance. And if you would like a refresher or to learn more about what that means, um, we kind of do a deeper dive on um, agricultural water considerations as they relate to the produce safety rule and module um, 5 1 um, of our webinar series at nativefoodsafety.org. So, once the um, tomato has been grown and harvested, it would move to, might move to like your on farm packing house. And from there, it would move to the sauce processor. And this is where um, the, one of the key affirmations. Um, would kind of kick into play. Um, so once, um, if the, the food is processed in a way where you are, the processor is using a kill step, um, the farm under the produce safety rule um, should keep an affirmation for that, that processing activity with the kill step occurred. But that also creates a ripple effect across the food supply chain for the trace proposed rule on traceability. And so what, because that processing step has occurred, as you might have noticed, um, this supply chain does not list um, key data element points for the tomatoes that have been processed because 
a kill step has happened for a food that's on the trace of food traceability list, which impacts all of the other critical tracking events um, across that um, supply chain. That's not to state that there might not be other um, foods that would require key data elements for a traceable for their traceability lock codes. But just to kind of narrow this hypothetical example down to um, tomatoes that are destined for processing at a um, processor or manufacturer. So thank you for joining us for a discussion on um, food traceability considerations, including a walkthrough of the proposed rule. It's been published by the US Food and Drug Administration. Um, we encourage you to um, review the other EATS materials, other empowering agriculture through tribal sovereignty academy materials and curriculum that might benefit you and your operation. But if you are interested in learning more about um, food safety activities, if they relate to the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, we also encourage you to stay tuned at nativefoodsafety.org. So thank you.